This is like the most interesting thing I've watched in a long time. Hello, namaste, welcome to my channel. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're gonna watch a really long video about 25 scientific facts about Hinduism. So this is gonna be really interesting, but it is quite lengthy, so let's get started. Namaste, the traditional Indian greeting, a gesture which marks respect, reverence, and love for the person we greet. So why do we greet people in this way? In yoga, this gesture is called the Anjali Mudra. It is a well-known fact that the tips of the fingers are major energy points. When we bring together the palms of our fingers, linking the tips of our fingers, then the nerve circuits of the brain are linked to those of the upper body. A feeling of calmness and well-being immediately descends. Also, in yoga, each finger is representative That's of a certain true. energy. Interesting. The little finger represents tamas or dullness. The ring finger represents rajas or activity. The middle finger represents sattva or refinement. The index finger is the individual soul or jivatma and the thumb is the paramatma or the ultimate soul. These are the reasons behind Namaste, the traditional Indian oh, greeting. Oh, interesting. Okay. Everything has to do with energy. That's neat. Agamartan to Devanam, Gamanartan to Rakshasam, Kurve Gantarvam Tatra, Deva Dahuana Lakshanam. I start my worship ringing the bell, praying that the divine may enter me and all demonic forces within and without depart. Traditional Indian worship always started with the ringing of the bell. The temple bell was a beautifully crafted object made of an amalgam of several metals, including zinc, copper, bronze, cadmium, and many other alloys. Wow. The quantity of each metal was based on very accurate scientific calculation. When the bell was rung, there was a resonation which created an immediate harmony between the right and left lobes of the brain. The echo lasted seven seconds, touching the seven chakras of the body. The sound of the bell created an instant calm, increasing the powers of concentration, helping you to focus on the higher. A well-designed temple bell could also produce the sound OM. No wonder they had to measure the alloys specifically. That's cool. Now I want to listen to temple bells. Think India, and the thought that comes to mind are pictures of the majestic temples of the land. These temples were not just immensely beautiful architectural wonders, they were also places of immense spiritual strength. Scientific analysis has today proven that these temples were built over areas of maximum positive energy. The Mulastana or Garbhagraha was built at the spot where energy was maximum. The idol was placed and the Garbhagraha built around it. This point indicated the place of maximum positive energy. Placed below the idols were copper plates with Vedic inscriptions capable of absorbing and radiating energy. When a person visited the temple and walked around the Parikrama, they came within the radius of this magnetic field, thereby imbibing a lot of positive energy. The result was that the visit to the temple rejuvenated him, body, mind, and soul. Ah, huh. I mean, that's why I like visiting temples. Ancient Indian scriptures were texts of religion and spirituality. The Upanishads were texts of immense spiritual strength based on authentic scientific facts. India had a long history of idol worship. The cognitive power of the mind comes from symbols. For example, when we hold a coin in the hand, we are aware of money power. 
money power itself is intangible. Our ancestors understood that it was difficult for a simple mind to comprehend abstract truths. Idol worship was the answer. When an idol is placed before a devotee, it helps him to focus instantaneously, increasing concentration and thus enabling him to move easily to his higher selves and realms beyond. The devotee was free to choose idols according to his inclination and likes. This enables instant concentration and easy movement to higher realms. Idol worship was then an answer to help devotees understand abstract truths easily. Why is it that traditionally Indians wore silk clothes while offering puja? Silk had the capacity to attract and absorb electromagnetic energy. The constant friction between the cloth and the body created an electromagnetic attraction. When the devotee did puja wearing silk clothes, there was an instant absorption of the energy created which was then transmitted to the devotee, creating a feeling of instant calm. So the silk Scott, also prevented called, loss of that energy, thereby leading aspect. to increased concentration. This was the reason why devotees all over India, whether the Maharashtrians for Ganesh Puja, the Bengalis for Durga Puja, or the Gujaratis for Lakshmi Puja, preferred to do worship wearing silk clothes. So puja is worship? Why do married women apply sindoor? The sindoor was applied not just to indicate a married woman. The sindoor was made of a mixture of lime, turmeric and mercury. Mercury? Mercury helped to decrease the blood pressure and also enhance the sexual drive. Hence, widows were not allowed to use sindoor. Mercury also helped to bring down feelings of stress and strain. For best results, Sindur was used all the way from the forehead right down to the pituitary glands, the seat of all thoughts and emotions. I don't know, but I feel like putting mercury on your skin may not be the best idea. Think of but Indian women know. and images of beautiful bangles of in different hues and colors immediately flash before the mind. So why did Indian women traditionally wear bangles? It is said that the tinkle of a bangle in a house kept the negative at bay. Ancient Ayurveda stated that the bones of the women were weaker than those of men. Bangles were traditionally made of gold and silver. These metals helped to absorb energy which was then transmitted to the body, improving physiological functioning. Also, the pulse which was felt at the wrist area was used to diagnose several major ailments. The constant friction between the bangles and the wrist area ensured good blood circulation. Again, the energy which was released by the skin was absorbed by the metals in the bangle and returned to the body. So, now we know that bangles were not just mere ornaments but also served a very good scientific reason. Okay. Interesting. I can't stand wearing bracelets, but that's just me. It drives me crazy. When we talk of Indian marriages, we immediately think of the Mehendi ceremony. Beautiful henna drawn on intricate patterns on the hands and feet of the bride. Why do we apply henna apart from the fact that it looks beautiful? There is a very scientific reason behind this. Applying henna cools the body and brings down fever and headaches. Traditional Hindu marriages are long drawn out affairs. They create a lot of stress and sometimes fever. Applying henna on the hands and feet brings down fever and why? reduces tension, cooling the body. Henna is also an important antiviral and antifungal agent. It helps to keep rashes down and brings down fevers and other ailments. Wow.
Oh, this is just rapid fire facts here. This is cool. Traditionally, Indian women wore toe rings. Toe rings were worn not just to indicate the marital status of the woman. There was a scientific reason behind wearing toe rings. Toe rings were made of silver and worn on the second toe. It is a well-known fact that there is a nerve which starts from this toe, goes to the uterus and then to the heart. By wearing toe rings, good circulation was ensured, thereby strengthening the uterus. The menstrual cycle was also regulated, ensuring speedy conception. Also, silver is known to be a good conductor. Silver absorbs the energy from the earth and passes it on to the body, thereby rejuvenating the entire system. These are the scientific reasons behind wearing the touring. Wait, is that it? Oh wait, it's only halfway done? Oh, I'm so confused. Okay, there's more. Indian women traditionally wore kumkum. Kumkum was applied on the forehead I was like, I want between more. the eyebrows. Today, it is scientifically proven that this is a major nerve point. The rishis of ancient India understood this to be the seat of the Anya Chakra, the center of infinite intuition. By wearing kumkum on the midbrow area, the power of intuition was increased. The center of intuition was opened up and increased concentration. It also helped to increase blood supply to the facial muscles. By applying kumkum on the midbrow areas, the Anya Chakra was automatically activated. Turmeric is an important part of all Indian cuisine. Turmeric is well known for its anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. All curry powder in India contains turmeric. It is also considered holy and is a part of all auspicious occasions worth its weight in gold like the color of the spice. Turmeric is an important anti-inflammatory agent. In combination with other antioxidants, it helps to contain inflammation. Turmeric has been widely used in traditional Indian medicine through the centuries. Today, turmeric finds an important place in conventional medicine and helps to cure diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and arthritis. Oh. But it has to be pure, I would imagine, and I don't think you could really get pure turmeric here. Indian women traditionally wore earrings. Ayurveda stated that by piercing the ears and wearing earrings, several diseases like hernia could be controlled. It also helped to regulate the menstrual cycle and restrict hysteria. The electric current within the body was also regulated by wearing earrings. Indian physicians and philosophers believed that by piercing the ears and wearing earrings, the power of the intellect, the thinking faculties, and the power of decision-making would increase. It also helped to contain incessant chatter, a process which would drain the body of all its energy, making sure that the person was calmer and maintained a certain dignity and decorum. So wearing earrings Problems associated with the ear channels could also be curtailed yeah. by wearing earrings. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Kind of straightening out the ear canal with the weight from the earring. Hmm. Never thought of it that way. Incessant chatter. See, the thought that goes into all of these facts is, is, is super interesting. The chanting of Om helps the mind calm down thoughts recede and there is an instant feeling of peace and calm. Om is considered the primordial sound of the universe, the first sound. This universal sound is a combination of three syllables, A, U and Ma. When we pronounce Om, as we say A, the lower portions of the body up to the stomach are activated. As we say U, the chest area is activated. With Ma, the face and the brain gets activated. 
the proper pronunciation of OM ensures good intake of oxygen required for a good body and mind. Mystics say that OM is like the clapping of one hand. Chanting OM ensures peace and quiet which relaxes the body and the mind. So how do you say it right? In Indian culture, oh. Tulsi is accorded the status of mother. Tulsi is also called holy or sacred basil. The spiritual and medicinal properties of Tulsi are renowned the world over. Tulsi is an important adaptogenic herb which helps to reduce stress. Tulsi is a remarkable antibiotic. Its medicinal properties are renowned. It helps to cure several ailments including the common cold. Containing no caffeine or other stimulants, Tulsi helps to increase physical endurance. Taking a Tulsi every day helps to maintain the physiological balance in the body and increases immunity. More important, Tulsi increases your lifespan. Keeping a Tulsi plant at home keeps insects and mosquitoes away. It is said that even snakes are kept at bay. In India, every traditional household from time immemorial to this day has the Tulsi plant for both its spiritual and medicinal significance. Certain trees were venerated Does in it, India. Like Most basil? important among them was the people tree. Basil. The people tree neither had tasty food nor strong wood. So why then was this tree considered so important? The people tree was capable of generating oxygen 24 hours a day. Our ancestors knew that the people tree generated oxygen day and night, making it vital to maintain the ecological balance. By associating this tree with the divine, our ancestors made sure that it was never cut or damaged in any way. Okay. Interesting. It looks like it'd be pretty recognizable. Certain trees were considered sacred in India. The Neem, the Odhambar and the people tree are some of them. These trees are propagated by seeds dropped by birds. The Audumba tree is associated with Lord Dattatreya. So what makes these trees so important? All these trees had the capacity to generate oxygen through the day. Our ancestors, understanding that these trees were important to maintain ecological balance, ensured that they were never cut or destroyed in any way by associating them with the divine. Okay. It's all so different than American In traditional culture. India, people ate their meals seated cross-legged on the floor. What were the benefits of eating meals seated in this posture? By sitting in Sukhasana, as this posture was called, the body relaxed, making the body ready for the digestive process. Also, the constant movement of bending forward and straightening up made sure that digestive juices were released, enhancing speedy digestion. While sitting and getting up, joints were made more flexible, removing ailments like arthritis. So, there were several benefits to eating your meals in the traditional way, seated in Sukhasana. Our ancestors stressed the fact that every meal should start with spicy foods and end with the sweets. What was the scientific rationale behind this theory? It is well known that when we take spicy foods, the body secretes digestive juices and acids which enhance the digestive process. Sweets contain a lot of carbohydrates which make for sluggish digestion. Also, the intake of sugar enhances the absorption of amino acids tryptophan. Tryptophan increases the levels of serotonin, a neurotransmitter associated with the feelings of well-being. That is the feeling that we experience at the end of a full meal. This was the rationale behind our ancestors stressing that every meal should start with spicy foods and end with sweets. This is just a 
Oh my gosh. This is so interesting. Fasting is one of the important tenets of Ayurveda. Ayurveda is based on the premise that most ailments stem from the fact that there are toxic materials retained in the body. By fasting, we help to cleanse the system and regulate body functioning. A complete fasting is good for health with occasional sips of lime juice. The body contains 80% liquid and 20% solid, just like the earth. The gravitational force of the moon sometimes creates disturbances in the body. Fasting helps to cut down the intake of acids, thus regulating stress and hysteria. Modern research shows that fasting helps to correct several ailments including Alzheimer's, cancer and diabetes. There is a popular misconception that by fasting we become weak. On the contrary, by fasting the system is cleansed and physiological balance is maintained. A day of fasting helps the digestive system and helps the proper functioning of several organs like the liver, kidney, pancreas, etc. The human body has seven chakras, starting with the base chakra or the muladhara and ending with the highest chakra or the sahasrara or sahasradala. The sahasradala is also defined as the thousand petaled lotus. The kundalini, energy that lies coiled like a serpent at the base chakra, can be made to rise through yogic exercises right up to the sahasradala. The enlightened master, his one, who through his spiritual practices raises the Kundalini from the Muladhara to the Sahasradala past the Shikha. Shushrut, the surgeon of Ayurveda, described this spot as the Adipati Marma. In the brain, this spot coincides with the Brahma Randra, the point where the Sushumna arrives from the lower part of the body. The Shikha covers this spot, protects it and preserves the energy, also called Ojas. Okay. In Indian culture, it is customary to bend down and touch the feet of elders as greeting. It is said that by doing this, you acquire intellect, knowledge, strength and fame. There is a scientific reason behind this analysis. The body is the storehouse of energy, negative and positive. The left side represents negative energy, the right, the positive energy. When we bend down and touch the feet of our elders, it indicates that we are surrendering our ego at their feet. This gives rise to karuna or compassion within them. As we touch their feet, this energy is passed on to us, thus also creating an instant liking between two hearts and minds. The nerves from the brain are spread out through the body and when we touch another person, it forms a circuit, thereby transmitting energy from one person to the other. We become the receiver and the other person is the giver of energy. But that's if they're barefoot. If we sleep with our heads towards the north, we invite evil spirits and ghosts. A myth but there was a scientific reason to why we should not sleep with our heads towards the north. It is well known that the earth has a magnetic field. It is also known that the body has a magnetic field of its own. Mm -hmm. When we sleep with our heads towards the south, then the unlike poles of the earth and the body attract each other. We wake up in the morning with a sense of well-being, of having slept well and rested. Similarly, when we sleep with our heads towards the east, the energy of the sun enters the body through the head and leaves through the feet, leaving you with a cool head and warm feet. When we sleep with our heads towards the west, the reverse happens, leaving you with a warm head and cool feet, an unpleasant sensation. Also, when we sleep with our heads towards the north, the iron in our body tends to coagulate in the brain creating disturbances, headaches, and unpleasantness. This causes a lot of disorders, including Alzheimer's, cognitive disorders, Parkinson's, and several other neurological problems. This was the reason why our forefathers insisted that we sleep with our heads 
towards the south or the east. Okay. I've, wow. Never heard that before. That's really interesting to think about, though. The saint and his disciples were walking along the bank of the Ganges one day. They came upon two people shouting angrily at each other. The sage decided that this was as good a time as any to teach his disciples a valuable lesson for life. Why do people shout at each other when they're angry, asked the sage. Because they lose their calm, said one disciple. Several explanations were offered, but none of them were satisfactory. The sage then explained, when people are angry, their hearts grow far from each other. They have to shout to be heard. When people love each other, their hearts are close to each other. They speak softly, and can be heard. They need not speak at all. Their eyes can communicate their feelings. When you are angry, said the sage, don't let your hearts grow too far apart or it may not be possible to come back. Aww. That makes a lot of sense. Throwing coins nice. into the well Excellent. brought good luck. What was the scientific reason behind be this custom. Tanks, ponds, rivers were the ancient water bodies. Also, coins in traditional India were made of copper, unlike the steel ones that we use today. One of the properties of copper was that when it was thrown into the water, it helped the dust particles to settle to the bottom, thereby making the drinking water available on top. Copper was also an important element needed for the body. By bringing in this custom, our ancestors assured that there was a daily intake of copper. Most common punishment methods. The Remember the threat. traditional punishment where you crossed your hands across your chest, held alternate earlobes, and sat down and got up as many times as the master demanded. Oh my goodness. This was a punishment that was in vogue from the days of the Gurukulam. But there was also a scientific rationale behind this punishment. As you sat down and got up several times, blood circulation was improved, stimulating better concentration and memory power. By crossing the hands across your chest and holding alternate lobes, there was fine coordination between the right and left sides of the brain. By pressurizing the points on the ear lobes, brain cells were stimulated, thus decreasing learning disabilities in weak students. So every day that I learn more about India and Hindu culture and traditions, I'm reminded how vastly different the culture is between India and the United States. There are so many reasons for that, but the one that sticks out to me most is after watching this video is that American families and American schools don't teach wellness in terms of energy or balance or inner peace. We learn about wellness by being told that it's important to exercise and eat balanced meals. Like that's the extent of how to be healthy in the United States. So it's super different, super, super different. The vast differences between the perceived understandings of how our bodies function is really interesting. I'm not saying that either nation is, is better than the other, by the way, I'm just, I'm just noticing these two differences. It's, you know, Americans just regard energy as like nothing more than what we get after we eat food or what the sun gives us. So yeah, you know, but it's, it's a very baseline understanding. Yeah, most of these scientific facts in this video and in Hindu tradition are based on the premise that energy is everything, everywhere, all the time. So we have two very different schools of thought on the topic. I really loved watching this. I thought it was gonna drone on a little bit because it was half an hour long almost, but it was actually fascinating and very concise. So thank you for everyone who recommended this video. I certainly enjoyed watching it and I hope you did too. My reactions were, I don't know, I, I was just kind of absorbing a lot of information. It wasn't the type of thing that I could be like, 
shocked about, but you know, just real. <laughs> thanks for watching. I appreciate your support. If you're a subscriber, thanks so much. You're the best. And if you're not a subscriber, click that red button and join our family here. Woo! Thank you. See you later.